Today, we're going to talk a bit about what to make of the arguments we've seen for and against the existence of God. And this is a question in general epistemology. Because what we are interested in is the question of whether it is rational or warranted or justified, or whether we're rationally entitled to conclude that God exists or hold the view that God exists. It's a question of what the evidence shows, one might say, or what the totality of information available to us confirms. In the epistemic sense, what should we believe in the sense having to do with intellectual concerns alone or theoretical purposes alone? What does the information we have that's available to us tell us about what is the truth and what isn't the truth? Now, that's not quite the question that we were looking at. That's not quite the issue we were looking at, because that's a holistic issue about what the totality of information shows. What we looked at instead was a more atomistic consideration. This atomistic issue about whether a particular piece of information is positively or negatively relevant to some claim or other is not the same thing as the holistic question of what one ought to think all things considered. So on the normative side of epistemology, there is both an atomistic issue. When is it that a particular piece of information confirms or disconfirms some other particular piece of information? And a holistic question concerning the totality of the information available to us, and whether it, all things considered, shows that a certain claim is true or that a certain claim isn't true, or perhaps is inconclusive. So we're really interested in the holistic question, and we do that by investigating the atomistic question because we assume there's some connection between the two, and certainly there is some connection or other. But here's a short and rather pessimistic take on the history of confirmation theory, which by my lights has its modern origins in the work of John Maynard Keynes in 1921. The history of confirmation theory reaches its maturity in the work of Rudolf Carnap, one of the greats in the philosophy of science of the 20th century. The lesson that we learn in this history from Keynes to Carnap is that confirmation is not a two-place relation between one piece of information and another piece of information, but is sensitive to background context or background systems of information. Now that muddles the waters when we try to go from the atomistic notion of confirmation between two pieces of information to the holistic question of what one ought to think all things considered. Now, what that means is when someone tries to present an argument for a particular conclusion, the only way that could be context independent would be for it to be a piece of monotonic reasoning where it doesn't matter what additional information you add to the premises, the conclusion is still supported. But as we have seen, the most interesting and perhaps plausible evidence we have avail available to us isn't an account as deductive evidence regarding the question of the existence of God or non-existence of God. Instead, it will have to be understood to be non-monotonic. 
So what's the takeaway? The bottom line is that an argument is an abstraction of a certain sort. So when we try to turn reasons and evidence into arguments, we risk losing information. We risk losing relevant factors. So there's the evidence, and there's what we make of it. When you put it in the form of an argument, you're citing the evidence. Well, the evidence is always relevant, but if what we make of it is also relevant, the abstraction we generate when we look at it in the form of an argument might be misleading. Personality styles also invade, for good or ill, the intellectual sphere, the cognitive sphere, when we abstract from all concerns other than interest in getting to the truth and avoiding error. There is still the question about how much of a risk taker you are and how cautious you are. One might say how much of a skeptical turn of mind you have. The more cautious you are, the less you will believe. So you'll miss out on a lot of truths. But the good news is you will also avoid a lot of false opinions. The more of a risk taker you are, the better you will be at finding the truth and committing to it. The downside is you will also increase your bevy of false beliefs. Now, of course, if you knew what those beliefs were, you'd give them up. But that's the story of the intellectual life. You don't have any crystal ball to look to see. All you have is your native dispositions and your capacity to learn from experience. How much of a risk taker or how skeptical a person is it most reasonable to be? You are not only considering the evidence, you are figuring out what to make of it. Now, when things go well, that's an important factor to consider. And it probably isn't completely a function of the background system of information, whatever that might be. There's also the issue of personality styles that enter into the story. When we try to turn rational considerations into arguments for or against a particular point of view, we are abstracting. And there's an incredible danger to be alert to about what happens when you abstract, when you drop things from the story for purposes of abstraction, that's what abstraction involves. You have to be careful that you don't drop central, important, essential elements. And the bottom line is you can't do that unless you're talking merely about deductive argument. There's always background information and even once you take background information into account, there's also personality styles. And you can be a normal, rational person who's much more skeptical than I am. Well, maybe not. I am pretty skeptical. But you can be a normal, rational person who's much more of a risk taker in terms of getting to the truth and avoiding error. There's a range of rational personality styles that are perfectly acceptable within the intellectual sphere. And as soon as you take that into account, you can look at these arguments as interesting thought experiments, interesting ideas to pursue, but they can't be definitive unless they're deductive arguments. One last thought on the distinction between arguments and evidence or arguments and reasons for or against believing in things. William James remarked in The Will to Believe, there are two things that we are apt 
we don't want to miss out on something important, and we don't want to be duped. Now, epistemologists have translated that Jamesian slogan into a two-part goal. The first part is getting to the truth. The second part is avoiding error. Now, that underreports uh, what James had to say, because not all truths are really important. That Jamesian slogan is relevant to the issue about whether arguments abstract in a way that misleads or is not really all that helpful. Because if what you're after is not to miss out on something important and to avoid being duped, those are two independent goals that you can weight separately. You can put more emphasis on the disvalue of missing out on something important, and so you end up being perhaps too gullible. You can also put too much weight on the avoidance of being duped. And then you're too cynical, skeptical, and you don't trust anybody or anything, not even perhaps your own senses. James remarked about skeptics, skeptics of the sort that we find in the history of philosophy, who said, nobody ever knows anything, nobody ever has a good reason for believing anything. It's better to do without belief altogether than to risk being duped. The James quote is, the skeptic shows his own private, preponderant horror of being duped. There's something right about that, but as soon as you start noticing that these goals are independent of each other, and you can focus on one rather than the other, then there are different weightings, even if making your sole goal in life to avoid being duped would be a little bit beyond the pale. And maybe believing absolutely anything and everything that anybody tells you is also equally beyond the pale. There are nonetheless weightings in the middle region where you're going to have to allow for variance between different groups of people, between different individuals. If that's true, then arguments are going to abstract in a way that doesn't take account of some things that must be taken account of when determining what's rational to believe. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that arguments aren't relevant. What arguments do is exert mild pressure one way or another. But the hope of an argument was that it could be definitive or conclusive or something like that. And while deductive arguments perhaps can play that role, non-deductive arguments have a more limited role, that they put pressure on an individual to reflect on the circumstances and situation and make adaptations elsewhere in their cognitive framework if they're not going to draw the conclusion that is claimed to be supported by the argument in question.